So we are talking about purpose and specifically the impact of purpose on daily life and effective ministry. And last week we established that humanity has an unquenchable desire to understand where we fit into the bigger picture. Knowing our purpose answers some of those age-old philosophical questions like why are we here and what is life all about? So not only is purpose essential for us understanding things on a philosophical level, it's also extremely important on a practical level. Purpose is essential to so much of what we value in life. Last week, I gave three examples of why purpose is so important. That is, purpose is connected to meaning. Humanity was not made to live continuously within the moment without some connection back to the bigger story. We need to know that in the ups and the downs, the good and the bad times of life, that there is purpose, there's meaning behind those things. Also, purpose is connected to direction. Without a sense of purpose in life, we meander. We just kind of lose our way and we drift through life and move towards demotivation and oftentimes depression. And the third is, purpose is connected to clearer goals leading to better plans. When we understand why we're doing something, that is the the bigger purpose, the bigger plan, it is easier to establish clearer goals and effective plans. Now, we took all of that generalized information about purpose, and we brought it into a very specific context for every single Christian. Every disciple of Christ needs to be able to understand the answer to this next question. What is the ultimate purpose of ministry? Now, some people might say, well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a ministry leader. In fact, right now, I'm not even serving in any way. So this isn't as relevant for me. Actually, it is. It is extremely relevant for every believer. One of the things that we share often in this church is disciples are made when we pursue Jesus by loving God, uniting with believers, serving the world, and entrusting the gospel. So that serving the world part, that ministering to other people part, that is at least a quarter of what it means to walk and to grow as a disciple of Christ. So it needs to be an important question for every believer. What is the ultimate purpose of ministry? Is the ultimate purpose to help people? Is it to love people? Is it to obey Jesus? Those those sound like they could work. Is the ultimate purpose of ministry to make disciples or to live out the golden rule or to glorify God? All of those seem like they could also fit. In a world that embraces the mantra, you have to look out for number one, what would compel Christians to humble ourselves, to give sacrificially, and to care for someone else's needs when we still have needs of our own? That's the question that we're answering out of John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. As I said this last week, this is a section that is referred to as John's last testimony. That is John the Baptist, not John the Revelator. It's John's last testimony, and it records this ministry transition that's happening between John the Baptist and Jesus. The entire storyline is one that is bathed in purpose. As I said last week, it's bigger than just one person stepping down in ministry and somebody else stepping up in ministry. It is a scene that only makes sense when we understand God's plan through covenant as well as God's plan and his purpose for individual lives. So today, I'm going to go back, do a brief recap of what we covered last week, and then we will finish out this section today. So if you're not already there, look with me in your Bibles, John's Gospel chapter number three. John's Gospel chapter three. I'm finishing the second part of the message on the purpose of ministry. John's Gospel, chapter 3, we begin in verse number 22 once again. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. 
He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there is a lot that's happening in these verses. And God, we recognize that apart from your spirit leading us into truth and enabling understanding, we just hear words and it doesn't come together in meaning. God, we need to hear it as you have designed it and as you wrote it. In Jesus' name, amen. So the lion's share of last week's message was on context, on background, and on setup. All the stuff that is necessary to not only understand the text, but to also understand what is the ultimate purpose of ministry. The verses, as I've said, describe the ministry transition from John the Baptist to Jesus. And the transition was more than about two men. It was a transition about two covenants. There's the old covenant that was represented by John the Baptist, and now there's the incoming new covenant that is mentioned and ushered in by Christ. So here's what is taking place within these verses. John the Baptist was the last prophet of the Old Testament. And he was assigned the task of wrapping up the old covenant by pointing all eyes towards Jesus who would mediate and usher in the new covenant. But that was easier said than done. For almost 1,500 years, the children of Israel lived under and they took pride in the Mosaic covenant that was established by God on Mount Sinai. It was a covenant of God's law reflecting God's holy character and containing the unique marks of Israel's national identity as God's chosen people. The Mosaic Covenant was also one that set Israel apart from all other nations and all other people groups. It detailed the social as well as the ceremonial regulations of Israel, and it was designed to show God's holiness to reveal Israel's sin and to lead them to God for ultimate salvation, which would come by faith. Galatians 3.24. But Israel missed the purpose of the Old Covenant. They thought that the purpose was to save. The Old Covenant was never intended to save. It was intended to show. The Old Covenant was intended to show God's holiness, to show their sin, and to show what is the proper path towards salvation. So they missed that. So almost 600 years before Jesus ever was born, God told his people that there was going to be a new covenant that he would initiate. And this new covenant would not focus on their ability to obey, rather it would focus on their willingness to believe. This is what it says in Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It goes on to say, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, know the Lord. Why? For they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. The writer of Hebrews quotes that exact section out of Jeremiah 31, and then he adds this onto the last part. He says, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. So here's the connections that we were making this last week. The old covenant would be obsolete and ready to disappear. The new covenant was about to begin and it'll last forever. John the Baptist was the final prophet of the old covenant according to Luke 16, 16. We find that Jesus is the sole mediator of the new covenant according to Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6. The old covenant highlighted the depravity of our sin nature that we acquired at our physical birth. The new covenant highlights the beauty of our new nature that we acquired at our spiritual birth whenever we were born again. The old covenant was a covenant of law. The new covenant is a covenant of grace. All of these transitions are now being set up within these verses, and they're going to continue as John the Baptist moves out of prominence and as Jesus now steps into the primary limelight. But for that transition to happen, that last prophet of the old covenant had to do his job. He had to know his purpose. 
His job, his purpose was to take the eyes of Israel off of him and off of their past and get the eyes of Israel focused on Jesus and on their future. That was his job. That was his purpose. That's the reason he was placed there as the forerunner of Christ. And John the Baptist was good at his job. He was so good at his job that the crowds that once flocked around him are now flocking around Jesus to the point that John the Baptist's disciples are now upset. They're, they're upset about Jesus' appeal. They're upset about Jesus' success. They're saying, hey, we're bothered because people keep going to the one you testified about. He's now baptizing and everyone's coming to him. Here's what we know for sure. John's disciples missed the purpose of John's ministry. That's where we ended last week. Let's pick up this morning. I want you to see what their concern was once again in verse 26. And we're going to also read the first part of John's reply to them in verse number 27. So let's read those two verses again. Verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified... Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. Look at his reply, verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. Verse 27 is incredibly important to ministry. But verse 27 is remarkably important to life as a whole. It is a verse that changes our perspective. It's a verse that grabs our attention and it shakes us just a little bit to make sure we're actually paying attention to what we do while we're serving God. Here's what he said. A man can receive nothing. Hi highlight nothing. Circle nothing. Underline nothing. Just make special note of that word nothing. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. So let me give you two truths based on that statement. Here's the first. God sovereignly determines what we receive. God sovereignly determines what we receive. It's very clear within that verse itself. It says a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. So think about that in a very practical sense. Whatever we have in life, such as gifts, possessions, talents, popularity, position, life, breath, health, relationships, all of those things are ours because God has given them to us. We can receive nothing unless it's been given to us by God or unless it has been assigned to us by God. Now, I recognize that understanding goes against every independent bone in our bodies. Because we like to think we actually did something. We like to think we are carving out our destiny. We're charting our own course. We are making it happen. And I don't want to do anything to discourage people from working hard and people from taking responsibility for their lives and for people setting goals in their life. All of those things are good, and I can show you Bible passages that would validate we need to do those things. But here's what I'm trying to do. There is a fine line between human responsibility and God's sovereignty. Here's where it's at in your notes. God's sovereignty does not discourage human responsibility. It reminds us that everything is ultimately determined by God. Now, here's what I, I've said that and I want you to walk away with. What I mean by that when I say God's sovereignty does not discourage human responsibility, God's not saying you just go out and do absolutely nothing. I'll fix everything. It is the fact that God still wants people to take responsibility, work, do what it is that he has called us to do. But we need to get into our minds that ultimately everything is determined by God. I'm going to give you several verses to kind of set that idea up. The first is 1 Chronicles 29, 11, and 12, which says, Everything in the heavens and earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as being in control of everything. Riches and honor come from you alone, and you are the ruler of all mankind. Your hand controls power and might, and it is at your discretion that men are made great and given strength. So here's a couple of questions based on that verse. 
Who owns everything in the heavens and earth? God does. Who controls everything? God does. Who controls power and might? God does. Where do riches and honor come from? God. Who makes people great and gives them strength? God. It's him. He's the one in control. Listen to these verses. Psalm 115.3. Our God is in the heavens. All and he does all that he pleases. In other words, there is no plan of God that can ever be thwarted. He does exactly as he desires. Proverbs 16, 9 says, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. In other words, there's nothing wrong with planning. You, you go ahead and plan, but know at the end of the day, if something happens, it's because God established those steps along the way. The next one, Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord which will stand. Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord has made everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. And here's the last one. I like to pause here for just a moment. Um, we have been conditioned to think if it's good, it always comes from God. If it's bad, that has to be from Satan. If that's your mindset, you will not like Isaiah 45, 7. It is very clear. It says, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. What you find in Scripture is passage after passage after passage after passage. It says, God is sovereign. He does as he chooses all of his plans will be accomplished. It is God who his purposes will stand. He controls everything. Riches and honor and greatness and strength are given out as he sees fit. He is completely in control. That's why verse 27 is so important. He says, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. When you and I understand the sovereign character of God, it should elicit our worship. It should break every prideful bone in our body. It should be something that should send us to our knees in humility. It should be something that would make us sit back and wonder at the glory and the majesty and the greatness of God. God's sovereignty is one of those key aspects of his character that forces us, forces us to look at the greatness of God. And he says, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So, a passage like that reminds us that God is not a doting old man who sits feebly on a throne of our creation. He is the all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present, ever-ruling, universe-creating God of the Bible. He said, you've got nothing unless it has been given to you from heaven. Jesus adds to that in John 15, 5 by saying, without me, you can do Nothing. God has the controlling say. We have what we have because of God. We are where we are because of God. Any accomplishment, any honor, any blessing, any gift, any accolade has been gifted to us by God. To claim credit is to steal his glory. God sovereignly determines what we receive. But here's the second truth. All leaders serve at God's pleasure. All leaders serve at God's pleasure. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. John's disciples were upset by Jesus' success. So John reminds them a man can receive nothing unless it has been given them from heaven. In other words, if you all are worried about my position, if you're worried about my popularity, I just need to remind you both of those were gifts on loan from God. They were never mine. 
If I had any success, it was because he gave me that success. Now, because everybody's flocking to Jesus, it's because the Father has said, go to Jesus. It's, it's been determined by heaven. If God chooses to take me down and lift Jesus up, that is his prerogative. He is sovereign. He can do that. I serve at God's pleasure. That's what he's trying to help them see. The implications of this truth are staggering. To those of us who serve in a place in ministry, it means everything God's servants enjoy in ministry, including the ministry, the gifting, the position, the popularity, the effectiveness, all of it needs to be held with open hands because none of it is ours. It's all His. That's what he's saying, 1 Chronicles 29. Everything in the heavens and earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as being in control of everything. Riches and honor come from you alone. You are the ruler of all mankind. Your hand controls power and might, and it is at your discretion, not mine, not a committee, not somebody else, that men are made great and given strength. It's all his. We are stewards of his time. We are stewards of his giftings. We are stewards of his opportunities. We are stewards of the positions that he has placed us in. They are all on loan from God under his control and intended for his glory. Now let's bring it all back together here. You're in the place that you are because God placed you there. You serve in the role that you serve in, wherever that might be, within the home, within the church, within the community, because God placed you there. And when God wants to move you, or if God wants to take you from a larger platform to a smaller platform, or if God wants to take you out of obscurity and bring you into a place of prominence, he can do that. He is sovereign. We serve at his pleasure. Now, all of that being said, here's why we need to point these things out. If God sovereignly determines what we get, and if all leaders serve at God's pleasure, what happens when we don't like our gifts and we covet someone else's? What happens when we don't like where he placed us because we're jealous about where he placed someone else? There are a lot of Christians who do not value the gifts that God gave to them because they want the gifts God gave to somebody else. They're, they're not willing to faithfully serve where God placed them because they're jealous about wanting to be in a position that God has given to someone else. They've made ministry all about them. And whenever we make ministry about us, we struggle with feelings of inadequacy. We live in a state of dissatisfaction, and we develop an entitlement mindset with God, thinking he owes us something more or he owes us something different. Now I want you to pause for a moment. At this point, you've got enough background and context and biblical truth you can handle what the actual answer to our primary question is. The question was, what's the ultimate purpose of ministry? Here's the answer. It's in your notes. The ultimate purpose of ministry is to make much of Jesus through the platform, opportunities, and gifts he loans you. The ultimate purpose of ministry is to make much of Jesus through the platform, opportunities, and gifts he loaned you. If your place of ministry is teaching children, then make much of Jesus from that platform and that opportunity and with the gifts that he has loaned to you. If your place of ministry is serving on a worship team or working in women's ministry or leading a Bible study, then make much of Jesus from the platform and the opportunity and through the gifts that he has loan to you. The same is true of being an usher, of serving coffee, of cleaning the building. Sometimes people think, well, this isn't spiritual stuff. Listen, the Bible says, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. It doesn't matter if you're giving out a cup of cold water to a homeless person. Are you making much of Jesus when you're doing it? It doesn't matter because if you don't make much of Jesus there, you won't make much of Jesus if he gives you another prominent position. It doesn't matter our Focus, our goal is to make much of him. 
this is incredibly important because God doesn't tell us how long he'll leave you in that position. It could be 20 years or it could be two months. The question is, did you make much of Jesus while he put you there? At the same time, he doesn't tell us what the next assignment is going to be. It might be a step up or it could be a step back. The question is, did you make much of Jesus when you were in the position? Now, you might think it's already uncomfortable, but I'm going to meddle even more at this point. Our assignment, regardless of where we serve in ministry, is to make much of Jesus. Our assignment is not to be a spiritual prospector. Here's what I mean by that. Some, person, some people serve in a place because they've made it about them to build their spiritual resume, to build their experience so that they can get the role that they really want down the road. So they don't ever fully serve where they're at because their eyes are always looking down the field saying, I'm doing this because it's going to get me over there. Listen, if you're not faithful with where God puts you, you're never going to get over there to begin with. The other thing, if God wants you over there, God has a way of finding his people. You don't have to worry about, I'm going to just serve here because I'm building my resume. One day I'm going to arrive. I'm going to be on the platform I want. I'm going to have the position that I want. The focus here is, will you make much of Jesus through the platform and the opportunities and the gifts that he has loaned to you? So I'm going to show you this now through an illustration and a final statement. Here's the illustration first. Let's read in verse number 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. Okay. The friend of the bridegroom served in a role very similar to the best man of today's wedding ceremonies. Other than the friend of the bridegroom actually had a lot of responsibilities other than throwing a bachelor party and like having a toast at the very end. Here's, here's what I mean. This individual oversaw many of the details of the wedding itself. This individual helped the groom prepare his house for the bride's arrival. This individual helped direct the wedding feast at the end of the betrothal period. This individual was responsible for bringing the bride to the bridegroom as the ceremony began. But the most important role of the friend of the bridegroom was to guard the bridal chamber during the feast. When the bride slipped out of the room after the ceremony, no one except the groom was allowed to go near the bridal chamber. The groom would then slip out of the feast, go to the bridal chamber, close the door behind him, and as the friend of the bridegroom heard the voices, voice of the groom behind the door, he now could step away saying, my job is now complete. His joy had now been made full because he had accomplished what that he was purposed to do. He had finished the job that he was assigned. Now, it's worth mentioning that according to Mesopotamian law, the friend of the bridegroom was forbidden under any circumstances to marry the bride even if the groom rejected her. That explains why Samson was outraged when his fiance was given to his companion back in Judges 14 and 15. Here's what John the Baptist is drawing a picture of. He's reinforcing the fact that he and Jesus have never been rivals. He has never had his eye on the bride. John the Baptist was the friend of the bridegroom. His job was to bring the faithful remnant of Israel depicted in the Old Testament as the bride of the Lord, and he was to bring them to Jesus who is the bridegroom. And whenever his job was done, he could then look back and say, my joy has now been made full because his joy was in doing the purpose that Jesus had given to him. His joy was not in his title. His joy was not in the size of the crowd. It was in the fact that he did exactly what God had placed him here to do. Now listen to this. Just before Jesus died on the cross, he uttered the words, it is finished. His work was done. When John the Baptist 
who saw the people flocking around Jesus, he says, my joy has been made full. My job is done. He said, here's my purpose. My purpose was to get the bridegroom and the bride together. And when I look out and see them together, I can walk away because that's exactly what I was placed here to do. Listen, he culminates this with this incredible statement. He must increase, but I must decrease. In other words, he must get bigger, I have to get smaller. He must get more attention, I need less attention. He must come to the forefront, I need to drift to the back. Why? Because the ultimate purpose of ministry is to make much of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus says himself. Where I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is the one who said, I will send the comforter, and he will never leave you. The promises of God are ours through Christ. Our job is to keep pointing people back to Jesus. If you want the promises of God, look to Jesus. If you need healing, look to Jesus. If you're broken and hurting, run to Jesus. If you're discouraged and you're overwhelmed with grief, look to Jesus. Jesus, the focus that all of ministry is about is to make much of Jesus through the platform and the opportunities and the gifts that he's given to us. Jesus is the answer. Our job is just give him Jesus. That's it. Do you see how simplified the job is? People don't need our best ideas. They need Jesus. Ministry was never supposed to be about us. Never supposed to be about our wants. Never supposed to be about our personal fulfillment. It's always been completely about Jesus. God, help us when we make ministry about anything else other than Jesus. It is embarrassing to think of what the modern church has tried instead of Jesus. For some reason, we have developed an apologetic attitude towards the world so that we don't want the church to seem too spiritual that it might drive people away. Call me crazy, but I think that non-Christians expect the church to be spiritual. I mean, I, I just people expect you go to church, there's going to be some spiritual music. There's going to be somebody probably teaching something out of the Bible. There's going to be an offering that's taken up. I mean, it's, it's kind of like we almost want to apologize for how spiritual the nature of the church is. The church is called to be the church. Our job is to make much of Jesus. And, and by the way, if making much of Jesus offends people, I'm sorry. We don't have another message you don't want Paul's message. You don't want my ideas. You need Jesus. You need Jesus in your marriage. You need Jesus in your daily life. You need Jesus for wisdom. You need Jesus with your finances. You need Jesus to build strong relationships with your neighbors. You need Jesus for purpose and forgiveness and life and peace. It's all about him. And when we apologize for making it about anything other than him, we're the ones to blame. Is it any wonder that people are confused about who Jesus is? Is it any wonder that people don't understand what he did and don't understand his eternal relevance to every soul on the planet? It's because we've made ministry about us. We've made ministry about how not to offend someone else. We've made ministry about growth trends and seating capacity and vision statements. The ultimate purpose of ministry is to make much of Jesus. That's all we have. That's it. Now, let me say, I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying we need to try to be offensive to people. Gospel's offensive enough. I'm not saying that we're not concerned about removing legitimate barriers so that people can clearly hear the gospel message. What I'm saying is, when we make the goal to entertain them, listen, whatever it takes to catch them is what it takes to keep them. 
And when you got them in through entertainment, you got to keep bringing the heat of entertainment week after week after week. If you got them in through your programs, you got to keep bringing some more programs. Otherwise, people say, what have you done for me lately? But when you bait the hook with Jesus, he is more than capable of keeping his own. Our job is simple then. You just keep giving them Jesus. What it took to catch them is what it takes to keep them. We get a golden opportunity to preach Jesus unapologetically. And somebody might say, that's a cop-out. You're not dealing with the real issues. No, 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 no. Listen, the more we understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more we see you don't outgrow the gospel, you grow into the gospel. The more you see who Jesus is and what he's done, the more you say he's the only answer, period. And that's how it was always designed to be, that the focus goes to him. So success in ministry is not about how many people follow a pastor or attend a church. The measurement of true success in ministry is are you making much of Jesus through the platform, the opportunities, and the gifts he's loaned to you? Somebody might say, man, I've, I've got just a small place of service. I don't feel like I can make a huge impact. Be faithful with the small place of service. Somebody might say, I'm a stay-at-home mom right now, and, and I feel like all I do is just handle babies and wipe noses and feed, make sure everybody's clean and alive. Listen, the hand that rocks the cradle rocks the world. Make much of Jesus in that time. Dads, listen, be a godly dad in your home. Be the best Christian version of yourself in the home. Make it so that your wife can see that God is living in and through you. Make it so that whenever the Bible teaches about a godly, heavenly father, that your kids have a role model that has been set by a godly, earthly father. Whatever your role, make much of Jesus in it. That's what our ministry has been called to be. Just make much of Jesus. So, here's what we're saying as we close. Where has God placed you? What gifts has God given to you? Some of you might say, I, I don't have a place I'm actively serving. I encourage you, pray about where God would have you to serve. A part of your growth in Christ only happens in the context of serving others. Somebody else might say, listen, I'm hurting. I, I served so much before that I'm just worn out. We don't ever want to add a burden to somebody else. Here's my prayer for you, and let this be your prayer for yourself. God, would you heal me to the point that I am spiritually able to serve with all of my heart once again? You see, sometimes we abuse servants of God because we just keep pouring off all of our junk on them saying, somebody else can handle the problems. Listen, every single disciple of Christ has been called to serve others. And whenever we are all involved in it, it makes light the work of ministry. Where's God placed you? How's God gifted you? Where are you serving? The ultimate question, are you making much of Jesus on the platform with the opportunities and through the gifts he has loaned you? They're not yours. They're just on loan from God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you would continue, God, to do your work in our hearts, Lord, we recognize that apart from you, Lord, we can do nothing. So, Father, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Lord, may our hearts be moved towards you in a huge way. May we fully recognize that our job, our purpose of ministry is to make much of Jesus. And Lord, as we keep pointing all of the eyes back towards you, God, would you draw people unto yourself? Would you redeem them? Would you set them free? Would you heal? Would you restore? Would you help people discover why they're here? God, release them from the burden of sin. God, give them the hope that we can have through Christ. God, you alone can do that work of ministry. But Lord, may we be faithful to keep pointing all eyes towards you. In Jesus' name, amen.